to let folks into the room um, as they can. Uh, just a quick housekeeping thing. Um, the first you'll notice uh, this event is being recorded so that folks will have access to it later on. And uh, the second thing as well, um, I know this is a uh, habit for most people. If you could keep yourself muted, um, unless you are speaking, we would greatly appreciate that just to reduce um, any background noise. So formally, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. My name is Ellie Gilmore. I am the president of the Villanova ICMA student chapter, and I'm very excited to welcome you to our spring 2023 Frank and Gloria Wolick speaker series, the intergovernmental picture public dollars in a changing economy. Um, I would specifically like to acknowledge um, some folks who have been instrumental in helping us uh, create this, some of whom are here today, um, some of whom are not. Um, of course, first and foremost, um, Gloria Wolek, um, without whom we would not be able to host this series. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Wilson, who is the chair of our MPA department, um, Dr. Kaczynski, the MPA director, and Dr. Arapas, who is a faculty member, um, and also who helped us organize this event. So, um, as I've mentioned, this uh, event is organized by Villanova's student chapter of the International City and County Management Association. Um, ICMA is a student-led organization focused on local governments with membership both at the undergraduate and graduate level, and we're very proud to have a chapter of it here at Villanova. We typically host about two events a year, um, and this coming fall, we'll be hosting a membership drive. So particularly students who are a part of the program through the fall semester should keep an eye out for um, announcements regarding uh, the membership drive. So... Let's get my screen prepared here. So as we all know, the coronavirus pandemic, um, which emerged in early 2020, has affected us in just about every possible way. Um, it has changed how we operate our personal lives, our professional lives. It changed how we conducted our business, um, how we interacted with one another on a daily basis. How do you um, do your thing, thing, Lena? Oh, you're here. <laughs> Great. Can I'm actually going to, yes, I'm actually going to pause my remarks then. Um, this is our uh, <laughs> vice president, Elise Huertas. I'm so glad you were able to join us. I was just kicking <laughs> off um, the introduction to uh, the event itself. So I, if you're able to pick up right now, go ahead and turn uh, this part over to you. Yeah, uh, Ellie, thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate it so much. So you looking to fill in for me. And as you know, I'm traveling. I apologize. I, I've been trying to get on since about 2.40 because I anticipated the possibility of having connectivity issues. And of course, that's what happened. So I'm actually on from a completely different device, but I'm here. So I'm so happy to be on with everyone. Um, good afternoon and welcome again. Thank you, Ellie, for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as Ellie began to say, and as we all know, the coronavirus pandemic, um, which was emergent in early 2020, has affected just about every area of our lives and changed the way that we do things in profound ways. The COVID-19 pandemic and quarantine has altered the way that we conduct business, the way we handle our personal and professional relationships, and changed the way we interact with one another on a daily basis. It has also affected how local government agencies, as well as not-for-profit organizations, interact and support one another. The COVID-19 pandemic and quarantine has completely transformed the way that we interrelate as public administrators as well. We were no less affected by the mandatory restrictions and dictates that reformed civil societal interaction and collaboration around the world. Public administrators have had to also pivot and shift in the way in which municipalities are served, the way that they service, the way that they allocate resources, and in how services are administered, finding new and innovative ways to collaborate and connect with those they are committed to in fulfilling their missions. We are continuing to emerge in 2023 from the global epidemic that we will surely never forget. And after two and a half years of constant tactical moves, we find ourselves settling into a new normal in our day-to-day -day personal and professional activities. 
There are many more opportunities to work from home and we are in more virtual meetings such as this one, a Zoom meeting, which is just an example of one innovative way we have all adapted to crossing hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles of divide to be able to connect and collaborate and fulfill our commitments to those that we serve. When Ellie and I were asked what we would like to focus on today for the International City County Management Association panel discussion, uh, this particular semester, what resonated with us was the pandemic and the effects that it has had on three different areas. We've actually chosen to structure our discussion today threefold. Number one, on the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past couple of years for local government and nonprofits. Number two, the current state of the changing economy and inflation, especially related to funding sources that in many cases were plentiful during the pandemic and allocated with less red tape and now have since been uh, either discontinued or deplenished. And then number three, the future of governmental relationships in a post-pandemic society. The three panelists that have so graciously accepted our invitation to share their insights with us today regarding our overall theme and intergovernmental picture, public dollars and a changing economy, will indeed shed light on how city and county local government agencies along with nonprofit organizations that serve local municipalities have navigated public service during these unique circumstances. I'd like to take just a moment to introduce our first panelist. And Ellie, is that okay? Can I go ahead on and do that? Absolutely. Um, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, as I am proud to say that I am a past student of his here at Villanova, David Grady. Dave is the township manager at Nether Providence Township in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. He has served as the manager since 2020 and served as the assistant manager for five years prior to that. He is a certified public accountant in Pennsylvania, and prior to his time in local government, he worked in financial services in the Ernst and Young office in Philadelphia. He is a volunteer accountant and served as the treasurer for the Starfish Foundation, a nonprofit serving underprivileged youth in Ecuador, which was founded by a Villanova graduate, no less. And he and his wife live in Westchester with their seven-year-old daughter and three-year-old twins. We share that in common. I have twins as well. He has twin girls. And he obtained his MPA from Villanova and is currently an adjunct professor um, teaching financial management, at least one class <laughs> that I know of, in the Villanova MPA department. So we'd like to welcome David, and then I'll turn it over now to Ellie to introduce our next panelist. Thanks, Delise. So our second panelist is Madeline Jacobson. Uh, Madeline and I actually know each other from undergrad, so it's great to reconnect um, in this uh, professional educational capacity. So Madeline is the transportation planning and project management professional currently serving as a project manager with a district five of California Transpor Department of Transportation or Caltrans. Madeline graduated Clark University in 2017 with a bachelor of arts in geography and completed a master's in city, plan city and regional planning from California Polytechnic State University in 2019. Madeline began her career in transportation planning in 2016 as an intern with the Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission and has served internships with San Francisco's Municipal Transportation Agency and the Southern California Association of Governments, beginning her full-time career with the Transportation Agency for Monterey County in California prior to joining Caltrans. Madeline has extensive experience with the regional transportation planning process and the various formulaic and competitive funding that comes together in delivering transportation projects. We're very excited to welcome Madeline, and I'm going to pass it back to Delise to welcome our third panelist. Thank you. And listen, last but no way in the least, <laughs> we have Monique Saunders. Um, I've also had the pleasure of watching our next panelist, Monique as her career has taken off in public administration over the years, Monique Saunders Moreno is currently the Assistant Director of Community Investments at the Lehigh Valley Community Foundation. In her role, Monique assists in managing the community investments function of the foundation, which include crafting grant-making strategies, implementation of grant-making cycles, and community leadership. Monique also serves as the point of contact for the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. Partners in the arts programs for Northampton, Lehigh, Carbon, and Monroe counties. And prior to joining the foundation, Monique spent nine years working in various business 
management and administrative roles that focused on company operations and culture, client experience, and project management. Monique has a Master of Public and International Affairs from the University of Pittsburgh and a Bachelor of Political Science from Cheney University. We have a wealth of knowledge and expertise on this panel. So please, please, please take advantage when it's time to ask questions. Um, we would love to have you um, allow them to share their wealth of knowledge with all of us. We will now begin our panel discussion. Each panelist has been des designated a question to begin the discussion for each topic. We will invite each of the other panelists to add to the topic of discussion once the initial panelist has completed their initial contribution. The audience participants can feel free to leave questions in the chat by all means. Our assistant department director, Miguel, will oversee monitoring the questions in the chat. And at the end of the panel discussions, Ellie and I will take volunteers for a verbal Q&A. Um, and then we will add relevant questions from the chat with Miguel's help at that time. Okay. So everyone, I'm gonna go ahead on and ask our very first panelist, the very first question. This question is gonna to go to David. Hi, Professor. <laughs> Hi, Elise. Thank you for the uh, warm welcome and the kind words. It's good to see you. <laughs> Wonderful, good to see you as well. Um, so David, this question has two parts and I'll try to go a little slower because you know we're trying to hop in and calm down all the nerves from all the technology issues. Um, this question has two parts. So first, without a doubt, the COVID-19 pandemic has added fiscal pressure to all economic sectors of government, or all economic sectors, government, nonprofit, and private. How has the pandemic affected your organization's financial management and overall fiscal health is the first part of our question. Okay, and at the same time, <laughs> at the same time to counteract the economic shock, federal aid has been unprecedented. A 2022 report by the Pew Charitable Trusts and Independent Organization that works to encourage responsive government and support research on a wide range of issues states that to date, the federal government has allocated more than $5 trillion to support the front lines of healthcare, private businesses, not-for-profit state and local governments, as well as individual households and subsidies or individual household subsidies. So the second part of that question after all of that is how effective was this intergovernmental funding to your organization specifically? And please elaborate on what else you would have liked to see the federal government do to help facilitate your organization in achieving its mission. Uh, thank you. So at the start of the pandemic, uh, as you, you can imagine, there was a lot of uncertainty. And I think that was the case across all the sectors for, for everybody. Uh, as Delise noted, I, I have twins. Uh, our twins were pretty much newborns at the start of the pandemic. So honestly, the last thing on my mind was worrying about my uh, township's budget. We were just trying to get through the day without falling asleep at work. Um, coming to work was less stressful. Um, I occasionally slept here, just kidding a little, but it was, you know, th there was a lot of stuff going on. Um, and at the start of the pandemic, the concern for us was more on the revenue side. Um, we weren't really sure what impact it was going to have um, in terms of collection of real estate taxes, um, other fees that, you know, we rely on for the, um, you know, continuation of the services in, in the township. Um, so for us, you know, we were still trying to work, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. We were trying to figure out what sorts of expenses we were going to have. But the main thing we started to focus on at the beginning was revenue. Uh, so we, we took this assumption that uh, most people that have mortgages are probably going to have their taxes uh, paid through their mortgage, you know, as part of that escrow process. So we thought that that would be something that would be fairly stable. And that's because the mortgage companies, of course, are going to want to make the payments because if people fall behind on their taxes, that gives the taxing authorities the ability to uh, place a lien on the property. Um, and then if, you know, eventually you get to a point where you're not receiving the payments, that, that taxing authority could, could force a sale and collect its dues. So the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mortgage companies have this incentive to make the payment so that they could be the ones to, to foreclose later. So we received a lot, a lot of that, and that was expected. 
But what we weren't sure about was taxes uh, from people who own their properties and pay the taxes to us directly. Um, and the collection for that was actually su surprisingly good. Um, and that was something that mm -hmm. we got to the end of 2020. Uh, it was uh, a good thing to see because one, it meant we were going to be able to be okay with our operations and not dip into our uh, rainy day reserves too much. Uh, and two, it, it also kind of gave us a peace of mind that it seemed like people in the community were, were doing okay, um, you know, as the pandemic was going on. Um, the expenses we were unsure of at the beginning included things like sanitizing uh, our uh, facilities here for our employees, uh, closing down parks, sanitizing park equipment. You know, we really mm -hmm. didn't know at the start of the pandemic what, how contagious the the this you know disease was was going to be, and so trying to figure out you know what needed to be sanitized, how often, and how to deal with these things was was an expense that you know we were sort of working through, but didn't end up being you know a, a significant thing. Right. Going back to revenues, um, there were a lot of communities that I think struggled that relied on. Um, uh, earned revenue taxes. Uh, so for us, we're not one of those communities that had an earned income tax, but I know a lot of communities that were, maybe that was half of their revenue. Uh, I heard estimates somewhere upwards of 40% in some communities where they they had lost that, that earned income tax. So as people were being laid off um, or furloughed and they weren't collecting revenue, obviously you weren't collecting those taxes. Uh, so I think that that mix of revenue streams is something that a lot of places we're, we're looking at, and that was something that we were mindful of, you know, and kind of grateful that we didn't have an earned income tax because that was something that that didn't impact us a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, as the pandemic has sort of shifted and, you know, I don't know if we're even fully out of the pandemic. I don't know when we'll be at that point when we're fully out of it, um, but right. for us, we're much more concerned about expenses than we are revenues. You know, we've, we've signed up, sort of been able to determine what our revenue streams are going to be. Um, with the exception of grant funding, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but as far as expenses, you know, trying to deal with the inflationary environment that you sort of alluded to earlier uh, in the introduction has been a challenge for us. Um, we have projects that we have been putting out for bid. Uh, we had estimates for those projects, and they're coming in, you know, sometimes, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent higher uh, than, than what we expected. And that's been problematic mm. for us. It's forced us to uh, push some projects down. Uh, the road, and you know, before the pandemic, you could you could get a cost estimate for something and say, oh, it's only a year or two old. We can still probably sort of rely on it. Now we're at a point where it's like that cost estimate's like two or three months old. We should probably refresh that cost estimate because it's already right. going going to be out, outdated. Um, so, so dealing with the uh, inflation and then the impacts that's had for uh, budgeting for us for. Uh, salaries. So for example, we, we've had to negotiate contracts recently with two of our unions, um, whereas having a salary increase of two or 3% might have been sufficient uh, and probably more than generous a couple of years ago, now seems on the lower end of things when we're looking at inflation that's been in the range of five to 8%. So um, mm -hmm. that, that's been a challenge for us, especially um, we're looking at that, um, you know, the salaries, the benefits, uh, insurance rates just for liability and health insurance, mm -hmm. uh, fuel prices, all kinds of things are, are trickling down and, and making things generally more expensive um, for us. Um, going on to the next question, how effective was this inter intergovernmental uh, assistance that we received? Um, depending on what we're talking about, uh, so to start off, there, there was the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act, you know, from, from our perspective, wasn't super helpful. I think it was more helpful more at the bigger city level and larger counties. I think for small, mid-sized local governments, uh, it was something that we, we took advantage of for um, reimbursement of expenses uh, that we were dealing with at the start of the pandemic. Um, one of the problems, though, was it, it wasn't a lot of money and the, a lot of the administrative burden that was associated with it was, was kind of difficult. You know, so for example, um, we had to track all the expenses, which is totally reasonable and something we, we should be doing. Um, we had to do a report through the uh, Pennsylvania Emergency Management Association, who was administering the money. Um, and then we had to have a meeting with Pima, uh, more calls with them. And then that got transferred to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management mm -hmm. Association. I did another report through them. And then we had to do meetings with them. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of work. And at the end of the day, we got like $7,000 out of it. And it kind of made me think like, is this really worth, you know, right, right. <laughs> the time and stress that we, we were going through that? Um, 
Something that was very helpful for us, though, was the American Rescue Plan Act, the, the ARPA funding, um, as we refer to it. When the ARPA funding first came out, it had a very narrow focus. It was intended for um, frontline uh, worker pay, um, uh, sewer work, um, whether that be storm sewer or sanitary sewer, um, broadband, uh, and then revenue replacement, which was actually very difficult to claim. Um, and uh, so, for example, if we had a big grant project going on that was not at all related to the pandemic, um, because of that grant funding that we received um, for a very specific project, it put us over that that revenue replacement limit. So I know there were a lot of interests that were saying, hey, we're losing revenue on this, even though we're collecting, you know, maybe grant funding for something else. So it, it, it isn't fair that it just, you know, put us out of the running for that revenue replacement. And uh, to the federal government's credit, they, they listened to that and they adjusted it and actually made it very broad. And so now the ARPA funding actually can be used for um, almost anything. You know, there, there are a few exceptions, like you can't put it into pension funds. Um, but with the exception of, the, of those things, it could be pretty much used for anything. And so that was great for us because we had a number of things that came up again that weren't uh, pandemic related, but they were big expenses that were problematic. So uh, just mm -hmm. to give you an example, one of our uh, ladder trucks and fire companies was in an accident. Um, and so we had to rent a ladder truck, didn't even know you could rent uh, a ladder truck, not something you get a budget, you know, but uh, <laughs> right. uh, that we rented it from another community. And that ended up being about uh, $8,000 a month for a ladder truck. And so that was something that would have just come out of our reserves in any other situation, but we were able to use the ARPA funding for that. We also um, have had, had a wing of our public works garage that was uh, in severe need of uh, repair. So we are actually going through the bidding process as we speak uh, to replace that wing. And that's gonna be about $600,000 project. Um, so it's mm. great that we had that ARPA funding because otherwise we would have probably taken out a loan for that. Um, in order to fund that project. So that, that was a great thing there. Um, and it's also been very helpful with some of our uh, sewer work and uh, water quality improvements. Water quality is something that's obviously a good thing, uh, but it's uh, there are certain requirements that we have to follow through the state that were a bit of an unfunded mandate. So it was great that you know this ARPA funding suddenly became available for us to use that towards meeting some of those unfunded mandates. So you know, I, I think, you know, the way the way I've seen the ARPA funds being used in in um, local government has been not so much in a response to uh, dealing with the pandemic, but more as helping jumpstart the economy. We might be able to argue that the economy has been jumpstarted maybe a little bit too much mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. might be uh, adding to some of these inflationary uh, pressures that that we're dealing with. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're looking at this was sort of a, a windfall in a sense, you know, having this this additional funding. In fact, one of the large communities in, in uh, Delaware County where I am, uh, the, the local paper, the headline was windfall, ARPA funding available for the community. And, and so, they recognize that as well, it seems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so so it, it's it's been great having, you know, some of this funding. There have been certainly other funding uh, sources made available through the federal government and through the state um, that have either had like low matches um, or meaning like the, the um, organization doesn't have to contribute much money, you know, in order to receive that grant. Um, so, so it's been nice that we've been able to take advantage for those um, to do projects in the community that we otherwise would have had to find other funding for tax increases. Well, and I thank you so much for that. That was such a comprehensive uh, answer to both of those questions. And I'm telling you, I'm still, um, I think one of my biggest takeaways is when you talked about the um, idea of the taxation in, uh, for residents in your area and how much so that would be affected. Of course, if many people weren't paying the mortgages, weren't able to pay their mortgages because so many mortgage um, notes or payments have automatic insurance payments that are associated. You know, you pay it at the same time. So when you pay your, your mortgage payment, the uh, um, bank then pays the city and the county and the school district and so forth. So yeah, that's very interesting. And then, oh my gosh, that $8,000 a month for the ladder truck absolutely makes me want to go and, you know, support my, my local, um, of, actually we have two, the Bethlehem Township Municipality and then of course Bethlehem um, City actually support where, you know, our district um, and actually, um, 
fire and paramedic services. So it makes you want to definitely, you know, give more and support more and donations. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your input. Um, I'm not sure if one of the other panelists would like to add to the conversation in any way. We have about three or four minutes to be able to see if either Madeline or uh, Monique would like to add from their perspectives. And David, again, thank you. You'll have an opportunity, believe me again. <laughs> so we'll come back to you. Um, and I apologize, guys, because I can't see. I'm actually on an Apple device, and I am an Android or a, an HP, I guess, um, uh, user, as I have no idea what I'm doing. I can just see me and Dave's face. So, Ellie, would you like to help that's, me out yep, that's a, Yeah, you bet. You bet. No worries. Um, <laughs> so, I think, yeah, Monique or um, Madeline, if you did want to respond, you can go ahead and just unmute um, yourselves. We'll, Thank you. You know, on the honor system. I can share a, a brief synopsis. So obviously I, I'm uh, participating in this discussion as a transportation planner and, and I'm really largely in the transportation, um, my, my background is in transportation planning and funding. Um, and now I'm doing project delivery. But one of the observations that I had, and I'll talk about it under my question, when it came to the distribution of the, the CARES Act, CRISA Act, and and American Rescue Plan Act funds for public transit being our public bus operators, they were able to apply those funds to support free fare systems and install hand sanitizers and touch-free payment methods to protect both their drivers and their passengers. And one of the things that the Federal Transit Administration did, FTA, is they, they distributed those funds to transit agencies through some of the existing funding programs that it that are in the statute. And that I think made it easier both for the state in administering the money, um, but also for our transit agencies to say, hey, this is a project that's typically eligible under the federal 5311 or 5307 or these numbered mm -hmm. programs um, to say, okay, then we can use our CARES Act funds for that project. Mm -hmm. So that's one sort of um, piece of the puzzle that I observed from my experience working in the state and I'll open it to Monique if you wanna add anything from your experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing it. Did you find that it was worth it for the time, the paperwork and the effort that you had to put in to apply for that CARE Act funding for your organization? Did you get out of it at least, you know, what you, you would think it was worth it to have put all that work in for? Yeah, I, I didn't work at a transit agency, so I was in the, the middle ground in the state in sort of administering the funding programs, but I definitely mm -hmm. know that our, many of our transit agencies that I did work with were able, if they were eligible for these funding programs, um, that they were able to apply it to, to good use. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. Well, then I guess it was worth it. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. And I think Monique wanted to add something um, and Monique, if you have a minute or two you'd like to take to add to that conversation. Yes, a minute or two is what I was a little concerned about because I <laughs> have some notes for, <clears throat> for me to share, but I know um, right now- You can share, I apologize, because you can definitely share more when, it, you know, when we get to your section, so that's fine. But it's just that if you want specifically to, to piggyback, let's say, on something that either Dave or Madeline said, we're welcoming you to do that now. Just for time's sake. And just really briefly, and like I said, I'll touch on it more in my answer. Um, I know that the ARPA funding, specifically for arts organizations in Pennsylvania, is like there's high demand for that right now. Um, it's really, really needed. And I want to zero in on those arts organizations specifically because that um, art, creative arts and the creative sector really represents um, some of those most in need in our community. And mm -hmm. so with that funding being in such high demand, um, it's it's difficult to administer and it's difficult to make sure that it's getting into those or to those organizations and those most in need. So I'll touch on that more in my answer, but definitely helpful uh, to hear what both of the other panelists had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that contribution. Either way, and we look forward to you adding to that um, when we get to your question. Um, but meanwhile, I'm going to turn it over to Ellie because she's actually going to introduce our next panel discussion question. So Ellie, take it away. 
Thanks, Thanks to Lise. Um, so we're actually going to uh, stay on this topic and we're going to stick with you, Monique, for the second question. Um, as uh, all three of you have alluded to um, in your responses so far, especially relative to federal funding, um, we know that it's been um, unprecedented in um, its amount, but also that it's been temporary um, in its impact. And so three years later, you know, since the uh, beginning of the pandemic, we see that the federal aid provided during that time is starting to dry up, and yet communities are still confronting how they're going to sustain their increased demand for services. And so our question um, to you, Monique, and then to the other panelists is, how have these recent changes in intergovernmental funds affected your organization's operation and its effort to serve its community? Thank you, Ali, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm just going to, in, in answering that question, I want to provide a little bit of feed, uh, background as to the role that I have. I'm working in and the organization that I work for. So I'm the assistant director of community investments. So I oversee our grant, our foundation directed grant making for the Lehigh Valley Community Foundation. And I want to just talk about that a little bit because it's like, what is a community foundation, right? <laughs> so um, I will say, if you don't know, do not feel bad because in the beginning of 2020, I had just given birth. Like Dave, I had was a mom, I had birth to my second child. Um, and I really didn't know what a community foundation was either. Um, <clears throat> but so we are, found, uh, we are actually a nonprofit, but we are a foundation that helps donors um, with charitable contributions. And so we accept those charitable contributions as gifts, and we will actually put that money into funds. Um, those funds will grow interest, and we will actually allocate that funding out as grants. Um, to kind of just give a brief overview. So we are a philanthropic hub. And as a community foundation, our focus is on the Lehigh Valley region, which of course encompasses three cities, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. And for the most part, um, two counties, which is Northampton and Lehigh counties. Uh, and so what we're looking at as a community is really essentially multiple communities that we are lumping in as one. And so, um, to answer that question about the recent changes and how that funding's affected our organization's operation. In 2020, there was the murder of George Floyd. We couldn't find toilet paper in the grocery stores. People didn't know what the future was going to look like. You know, um, if you had a job that required that you physically go in, there was added pressure with masks, sanitizing, everyone was making adjustments, trying to figure out how they were going to survive personally, professionally, economically, the government, you know, everyone mm -hmm. was. And so as a foundation, we became a means for people to help one another, right? So we had generous donors who would give, um, maybe increase their charitable giving to help with the situation and the chaos that was going on. And so mm -hmm. that was part of the positive that was happening in 2020, it was up to, uh, an uptick in grants. Um, you had people trying to get more involved. On the downside, you had so many more people in need. And so as we are trying to find the best ways to grant out our funding, we're finding that so many nonprofits are, are worked to the bone. Their employees are worked to the bone. It's really hard to adjust to the technological changes, the demands that um, mm -hmm. the public was facing and to still be able to provide any kind of work-life balance, enough money for people to survive and get what they need personally at home. And so for us as a foundation, what we really realized and what many community foundations, not just ours, around the country started to realize is that we needed to be more involved. Like we really needed to put our ears to the ground and find out what's going on in our local communities, get more mm -hmm. connected. Traditionally, and part of the reason you may not even have heard of a community foundation before is community foundations were kind of just quiet, passive organizations mm -hmm. that get involved with the community like that, right? Mm -hmm. They would accept those, that was those donations. And typically your donor may say, I would like to grant out to you know, such and such organization because I have a longstanding maybe relationship with them or I care about them, which mm -hmm. is okay. 
But if we really want to make an impact in the community, we have to understand what's going on in the community. And you're not going to understand that by just sitting at the table and talking to the friends and family that you know, it's connecting with those that you don't know. And so part of our role as a foundation is also to, um, to push ourselves to be more equitable in our giving. So understanding diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, what that looks like in our community, what that looks like in terms of those who need, who have the most need. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so as we were receiving funding, that became part of our focus because we said we can't become a more impactful organization without looking at ourselves. How are mm -hmm. we giving out this money? What does our community look like? What are the needs of the community? <clears throat> and what are the barriers that stop us from learning what the needs of the community are? So for example, what would a barrier be? In the Lehigh Valley region in Whitehall, which is just north of Allentown, there's a large population, uh, there's a large Syrian population, many of whom have moved straight from Syria. I believe someone told me, now this may be 10 years old, so I don't know how, mm -hmm. it, but I want to say that that is like the largest community of Syrians outside of Syria. Like, mm. yeah. So mm. you, when I worked in banking years ago, I worked in Whitehall and you had always an Arabic, um, like we had an Arabic uh, mortgage broker. We had um, at least a few tellers that spoke Arabic because we mm -hmm. had such a large Arabic speaking population. Right. Now, and when you're looking at the entire Lehigh Valley, they're not that large of a population, but when you really zero in on the needs of the community, they, they are a population that needs to be paid attention to and we need to be able to connect with. So that's an example of that. So, um, so I, in summary, um, as a foundation, what we wound up having to do is really look to build more relationship with community leaders mm. and uh, start being more strategic about who we're meeting with, who we're spending time with, how we're spending time, how much time are we spending, asking the right questions, really making sure that we are um, listening to what the community is telling us and what the needs of the community are, and then taking that information and translating it into our grant making. Um, one of the ways in which we were able to do that is now for our grants, we do accept video and audio responses. Mm. So um, you, sometimes you may have Excellent. an organization that like, maybe they don't, they can't afford a grant writer, right? But they're doing awesome work. And maybe the, they're better off being able to show us the work that they're doing mm -hmm. or a testimonial from someone who was impacted by it. So that's a, an example of that. Um, and I will also just note I know that we had mentioned that I am the point of contact for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, Partners in the Arts Program. Um, really briefly, I will say that in addition to the grant making I do from our foundation, the state of Pennsylvania has a council that was appointed by a previous governor that helps to allocate funding to the arts specifically. And so I basically re-grant money from the state into the arts in Lehigh, Northampton, Carbon, and Monroe counties. Our foundation received that partnership during the, uh, in early 2021, so we were still feeling the effects of COVID. In fact, I don't think we had even had the second wave of COVID really like hit at that mm -hmm. point. And one of the reasons that it was important to us is because the creative sector, as I mentioned, is one of those areas where people, um, They'll love to see shows, right? It's really, it can be really supported, but those who work in the creative sector tend to be the most vulnerable. Right. So I will say, um, I went to a conference with the Americans from the Arts and some of the information they gave us was that going into the pandemic, creative workers were two and a half more, two and a half times more likely to live in poverty. Two and a half before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We saw, about $20,000 drop in anticipated income before the pandemic and during to during the pandemic for um, households that worked in the creative sector. And so being able to re-grant funding to support 
arts organizations and those who are entrepreneurs. Uh, we do give out to, up to $2,000 to creative entrepreneurs to help support the work that they're doing is one of the ways that the state is trying to help support people getting back on their feet. But $2,000 is, is not that much money, right? So a lot more I could say there, but it looks like we might be at time. So <laughs> well, it's it's whoa, we, we, we so appreciate <laughs> yeah, and we we so appreciate the perspective that you bring from the community foundation. You know, we're talking about the intergovernmental picture, and I think sometimes in these conversations we focus exclusively on government. Um, and while obviously that's uh, an incredibly important institution, there are so many other stakeholders um, who have an ear to the ground of relationships to the community. It's important that those perspectives get included. So we're really grateful to have you here to have your insight. Um, you know, in response to this question. And so just with a couple minutes left on this one, I'd like to see if David or Madeline um, would uh, have anything to offer um, on, on this topic. Madeline, you wanna go first? No, you, you can go right ahead. I'm still pulling together my thoughts. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Monique, thank you for sharing that uh, information. I actually lived in Bethlehem for a while, um, and uh, I imagine you do a lot with Arts Quest up there. Um, it's really mm -hmm. incredible to see the uh, turnaround that the Lehigh Valley has had, I would say, over the last like 20 to 30 years um, after the, the fall of Bethlehem Steel and all that. So um, it sounds like your, your organization is doing great things there. Um, so well, well done. Um, the, so for, for where I am in the, the, the governmental sector, um, with a lot of the funding that we received, um, it's, it's been great, as I noted, um, it's allowed us to do some projects that we maybe otherwise would have had to find other funding for, um, or get to a point where we would have been raising taxes. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, there are some effects of the pandemic that are gonna be lingering, you know, in terms of like the, this inflationary pressure that we're all dealing with. And oftentimes grant funding that becomes available um, it, it's great. It lets us do these projects that really help the community, um, but at the same time, they're they're very um, project specific. Um, so a lot of the challenges that we're dealing with are operational um, in in terms of you know salaries, insurance, uh, doing things just like trying to pave our roads. Um, those are things that there's not funding out there for that. Um, you know that the uh, you know federal government, the state government, they want to provide funding for projects that are exciting and you know it's something you can point to and say hey look cool we made this happen and that's great and they should um but it's these these operational pressures that we're going to uh, continue to deal with uh, going forward that are are going to be challenging and, and trying to navigate that without um you know adding to the tax burden that our uh, residents already have to deal with absolutely if i can just say really quickly that um that we've heard that feedback from um, grantees for for grant making as well, and um, we've started to institute something called trust based philanthropy, which really pushes for funders to have less restrictions on the grants that they're giving, so that it can really that can also help to um, make sure those grant dollars are being best used. Um, mm -hmm. And in our partnership, I can say at least with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, that's one of the ways that they lean on us to help shape their funding. And so getting that feedback from us to help us, we will collect grants and actually um, collect the grant, I'm sorry, grant reports to see where the impact of the grant was, collect those reports, gather that feedback and help to report back to the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and say, well, this was the impact. Here's why it was impactful. Here's maybe where there was opportunity. So I love you sharing that actually, Dave. That, that's great, Monique, that you're being responsive you know, directly responsive to the feedback that you're hearing. Because sometimes I, I think especially, I have a little bit of experience in the nonprofit world, you, you need that money just to help you get over that hump, you know, operationally speaking. Like if, if we're gonna fail later this, this year, you know, it doesn't matter if we're getting money for a project down the road, if we're not gonna exist anymore. Right. Um, so I, I think it's, that's great that you've been able to loosen some of those strings to make sure they can best use their funding. Great. Thank you both. I wanted to just, we're, you know, being real uh, uh, 
sensitive because we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so just with a, about a minute or so, if Madeline, if you did have something you wanted to add, um, if not, we are going to continue with you into the next question. So we'll, we'll get everyone's <laughs> feedback. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ellie. I, I'm really uh, inspired by this idea of evolving grants to accept video and audio responses. That struck me as something that I can learn from in, in my work in the California Department of Transportation. Um, so thank you. That was really cool. Really cool <laughs> to hear and participate in this discussion. I think one of the things that um, we're all learning through these discussions is that if nothing else, the pandemic has been just a massive learning experience um, and that a lot of the professional practices that we are used to, that we have um, executed over however you know long we've been in our various fields um, may need to change. They may need to be more responsive um, to the communities that they aim to assist. Um, so with that, we are actually going to move on to our third question, uh, which we are going to uh, punt to Madeline. Um, and this is sort of looking at uh, lessons learned, big picture, um, you know, our uh, discussions also highlight the importance of intergovernmental and inter intersectoral funding and the relationship between the public sector's ability to serve their communities, both during in a crisis and its aftermath. So, you know, David, you mentioned, you know, we're not really sure what living with this pandemic looks like now, what it will look like in the future. We're still navigating that. So, um, Madeline, we wanted to, to start with you and ask what you feel are the top lessons that you've learned um, in your position um, during this experience the last two to three years, and what do you think the future of intergovernmental and intersectoral partnerships look like? Thanks, Ali. And this is one I absolutely want to reserve time for our other panelists to chime in on, too. Um, but I, I think this is an excellent question and, and I'm really grateful for participating in this dialogue this afternoon. So I've been a fairly, I've been in working in, in transportation full time for only about two years, but the bulk of my career then was, has been during the COVID-19 era. Um, and so reflecting on lessons learned, I'm limited in many respects that the bulk of my career has been during COVID. Um, as a full-time working adult. But one of the lessons learned that I kind of touched on in my, my response to question one is that it's been a lot easier from my observation to distribute funds and work within some of our existing funding avenues than I've observed than it is to create brand new programs for both governmental bodies, our regional jurisdictions, and our partner agencies and organizations um, to build a brand new understanding of. And I know that in government, there are a lot of funding avenues and revenues that come together when it comes to delivering any type of larger scale project. And each of those strings have their strings, there you go. Each of those revenues have their own strings attached, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's certain funding that can be only used for certain activities or has to be matched by a certain threshold of local or state funding. and with the influx of federal COVID relief money, from my experience um, in the transit planning era, I thought it was really smart to distribute those funds through existing avenues with, in the way that FTA approached it for some of the revenue. And I was only exposed to pockets of that revenue. Um, but that reduced some of the major learning curves for, for my agency, for Caltrans, as well as for our transit operators who were already wrestling with limited workforce and declining revenues um, to be able to integrate that new revenue stream into their their pot of operational funds. So that's one one lesson learned is is to not reinvent the wheel whenever possible, really. <laughs> um, but a second lesson learned that I I think about a lot is that governmental employees, government, we're really behind the times when it comes to being innovative and pushing our own boundaries. But this pandemic showcased that we can and we need to, in many cases, <laughs> right. solve our practice. 
Um, and one of the examples that I observed in real time as a, a planner at a local agency was the shift from not funding specifically, but the shift from in-person council meetings and board meetings to virtual council meetings and board meetings through mm -hmm. approvals and extensions around the Brown Act and so forth. Mm -hmm. And while it took our agency's time to secure our networks, and I was working off of a personal laptop because we didn't have laptops, like there were a lot of battles that we had to uh, overcome initially. I think that that's established a long-term opportunity to engage stakeholders. And I'm participating in this from California. So there you go, mm -hmm. another example. Um, but to create stake, uh, innovative spaces that we probably wouldn't have otherwise imagined um, in a pre-COVID era. And so I hope that we'll be able to see these types of innovations in government and government operations continue to push forward. And it's part of my goals in public service. Um, and yeah, to continue to push the boundaries of, of our traditional practice. And so looking, looking forward, I, I strongly recognize, and I, I've worked largely in transportation, but there's no one project that can be implemented by a single agency alone. And you think of a simple sidewalk project, but if you're adjacent to a property owner in a jurisdiction and or you have to do who knows what grading even to, to go down into the ground um, and you're installing a curb ramp and or there's so many features that can come together and mm -hmm. we can't work in, in individual silos. And so I think interagency partnerships are what lead to the most innovative and effective work. And one of the values that I bring in my, my work practice um, is really to be willing to hold difficult dialogue. And it's sort of why I've entered this era of project management, because I'm now interfacing multiple different priorities with one underlying goal. Mm. And so that's sort of the direction forward is, I think, continuing to hold interagency or intergovernmental or interdepartmental, right, for the Department of Transportation. Um, dialogues in virtual or in-person spaces and keep pushing forward and pushing our own boundaries because we can and we we in many ways need to. Um, but with that, I'll, Ellie, I'll turn it back to you and my other panelists. Yeah, thank you, Madeline. That's, I, I appreciate you ending on an optimistic note. Um, you know, we we talk a lot in this particular public administration program about you know, government being slow for a reason and the the, the merits of that process. Um, and that sometimes, you know, it feels like we're standing in our own way. Um, but I, I do really appreciate your perspective and your optimism and, and that even in these really challenging times that all, all sectors can um, learn from this opportunity and, and think critically and innovatively about how we can be better public servants. Um, and so with that, I would, you know, certainly love to, to open it up to, to David or to Monique to respond um, in these last couple of minutes before we start our Q&A. Monique, do you want to take it first? Um, sure, I'll give it a shot. And I'll, I'll be quick so that you have some time too, David. <laughs> Um, I loved, I was inspired by the fact that Madeline did finish off with like a more optimistic note and it actually made me think about, um, so I know I had mentioned the partnership that I have with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and I want to um, just highlight that our government does a lot. They do, there's so much that government does and, and, and to try to meet the needs of the people. And one thing that I can share is that in my partnership with that, with the council, and as they talk about, you know, what it's like to be working and facing um, the needs of the people as a government employee, they're really open to hearing what the community needs. Um, for example, I ran into the executive director of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts just about two weeks ago. And he really wants inviting me to come and just sit down and talk and say like, what am I seeing? What needs to be done? Like, how can we learn more about what the community needs? Um, and I will share that there is a chance that our foundation will be getting more state dollars to re-grant out 
uh, it's actually ARPA funds. Uh, and so I'll just keep it really, you know, we haven't heard anything for sure yet, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but one thing that That's is great. during that application process, and as we were talking with the state about possibly doing that, they were very open to us designing that grant process in a way that we thought would make it accessible for the public. And they really said, listen, you guys are the experts. Like we're really here. We just want to get this funding out. And I have mm -hmm. to say, um, I think that our governments, uh, COVID really pushed the capacity that our governments have. And I really appreciated the attitude of collaboration and really just wanting to support people and get that funding out and make a difference. So uh, that was that. that's what keeps me going. That's the passion that keeps me in doing what I'm doing. And so I appreciated what Madeline just shared. And I, I would just add, I uh, also, you know, echo that sentiment of the ending on a positive note, because, uh, you know, especially with regard to like the innovation in, in government. Uh, so for us, you know, when it came to transparency, we used to uh, broadcast our meetings on TV and we still continue to do that. Um, but the COVID pandemic was an opportunity for us to start live streaming on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And that was a, a new thing for us. We had to get some new technology for it but COVID kind of forced us into doing that. So that was, you know, something I, I could certainly relate to what, what Madeline said. Um, a, a couple of, uh, you know, things that, you know, I've, I've learned from, you know, this, the, during the pandemic, um, you know, work closely with your peers. That was something, you know, I, I work with local government managers all the time, my neighboring communities, we're not competing in any way. We're all working together. We're, we have similar goals. Um, so being able to lean on them and then the various uh, professional organizations such as ICMA, uh, a, uh, the Association of Pennsylvania Municipal Managers, et cetera, you know, they're, they're great organizations um, and they can really do a lot to help you uh, advance in your career and help you serve your community. Um, working with our partner organizations, like being able to call them uh, you know, like the, the superintendent of the school district, um, my state representative, like I, I can just pick up the phone, you know, I, we all have each other's cell phones. And at the start of the pandemic, we were talking to each other all the time, like, hey, you know, what, what's an area where uh, somebody needs help and, you know, maybe trying to secure some funding. Like, for example, working with our state representative, she knew that we had this park in one of our low to moderate income areas that really needed some rehabbing. Um, so she listened and she was able to help us secure some funding. And we put a new playground there, uh, did some work with the athletic fields and have uh, really done some things that have, you know, excited that part of the community. Um, and so, so I, I think being able to have those dialogues and getting to know the people that you're working with, you know, either at your level um, or at different governmental entities has, has been very important in helping us, you know, meet the needs and deal with the funding challenges um, during the pandemic. And really, I think that just applies even when you're not in a pandemic. And it's always, always important to have that. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you all so much for your responses, um, for ending uh, the panel discussion portion on a, on a positive note. I think everyone in attendance today, as well as those who hopefully will uh, view this afterward, um, there's so much that they can take away from, um, you know, those of us who are hoping to be public administrators who already are. Um, I think we're we're very lucky um, to have you three uh, working in this field and sharing your your knowledge and expertise. Um, so we are going to move on to our Q and A portion of um, this event. Um, we'll probably keep it to about ten minutes or so, just so we can uh, get everyone out of here virtually um, at four fifteen, as promised. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to check in briefly with um, Miguel if you had had an opportunity to send any questions ahead of time to Miguel. Um, we'll start with those. Um, so I'll just. Yeah, so uh, I did check there were actually there were not any um, you know, questions during the, the Q&A, so you should be go good to go with just, uh, you know, participation. Awesome. Thank you. So we are going to open it up um, to folks on uh, the call. If you would like to ask a question to any of the three panelists, I think the easiest thing would be if folks know how to use the raise the hand function. Um, 
that would be great. If you don't, it's okay. We'll, we'll moderate accordingly. Um, but we've got about, about 10 minutes to, to ask some questions. Ellie, if you don't mind, I'll just say in my experience with these, uh, with um, Zoom meetings and Q&A, sometimes it takes people a couple minutes to get their questions together. So one thing I just wanted to share, just knowing what your background, what, you know, ICMA stands for is that we are actually, we just posted um, an internship position here at the Lehigh Valley Community Foundation in community mm -hmm. investments. And so that role would actually be for the intern to like um, review any grant reporting that we receive and just kind of research, like help us dig deeper when we're hearing back from um, community partners and grantees about the work that they're doing and the impact of our funding. And so I thought this might just be a good forum just to kind of share that. And so I can put that link in the chat if you all want to take a look at it and just learn more. Um, and hopefully that gave people a little bit of time just to think of their questions. That is an awesome thing. Um, we definitely yeah. would appreciate you sharing that link. And we um, we have a, a space um, for uh, students in our department to seek those types of resources. So we can also make sure you get connected. Um, I think maybe that's something that Miguel might be able to facilitate getting that information so that students can um, take a look because that sounds like a, a wonderful opportunity. All right, I'm going to take a look and see. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Oh, I'm trying to... I see, ah, Hello. we have one question. Uh, I think we'll start, yes, um, Adam, Dr. Kuczynski, he is the uh, director of our MPA program. Thanks for joining us. I'll open the floor to you to ask your question. Thanks so much and thanks to all three of our panelists. This is phenomenal. A number of my students are here and um, it didn't take much encouragement to get them here. I think this is a really great thing for folks. And, and one thing that I find amazing, I'm speaking for a lot of them possibly, is the fact that sometimes I, I get stuck thinking about the world as I lived it, right? And you guys did a great job talking about COVID and even um, how, how, um, how you talked about how you started your job in COVID and things like that. All the stuff we're talking about, what do you think the post-COVID world is going to be like? Because now this is everybody's antecedent, right? Everybody knows now this is a possibility. Before that, everybody was kind of like, okay, this is all new. Like we were saying, like Dave, like you were saying, un, un, you know, we don't know what this ground is like. We're all going to see where it's going to go from. Do you think this now resets a paradigm for something catastrophic happening in the future? Is this a new normal, a new pathway? I would just love to hear briefly what you think about that. All three, thank you. Very good question. I can start off. Um, I, I feel like I've had conversations with my staff before about just various things and someone would say like, you know, whatever the subject might be like, I, I can't imagine anything like that happening. And it was kind of like, well, after COVID happened, you know, like no one could ever have imagined COVID would, would be a thing. Uh, one of my board members is actually an emergency room doctor. And uh, a couple of days before the world shut down, uh, he was at a conference and he came to one of our, our board meetings. And, you know, this was before we were in our, our public meeting setting. Uh, he was like, look, the world is about to shut down you know, everything was going to close. And we're like, man, this guy's crazy. I mean, he was sort of a new board member at that point. Like, this is crazy. Like, this isn't, this isn't what's actually going to happen. And he was exactly right. Uh, that's exactly what, what did happen. And so for me, it's, it's made me step back and think like, wow, really anything is possible. And even if you think you're prepared, uh, you might not be, and that's okay. Cause there's, it, you know, you, you just have to adapt and the whole world, you know, has had to adapt. Uh, unfortunately, this wasn't something that was unique to one sector of the economy or one area of the country. This, this was the whole world and we have all figured out a way to, to change. And I, I think in some respects, we've had to change for the better and it's created a lot more 
uh, flexibility um, in how governments are responding to things, and I think nonprofits as well. Uh, so I, I think it's it's something that could happen again, um, but I think if if it ever did, we all at least feel a bit more prepared than we were before. I'll share from my perspective, really thinking about my work as a a new professional working full time is I think we've created a new baseline environment that will continue to evolve. And one example being that I was onboarded in person, but so many of our new staff coming in are onboarding either hybrid or telework only. And so that by nature of the way that you're entering these organizations is part of the next generation. California has some permanent telework positions statewide that will never, we don't have the office capacity to go back full in person. And so there is some in, like institutionalized change for the staffing of, of the state's sort of transportation workforce, at least from my perspective, that I think has created a new baseline and maybe will sh like fluctuate hybrid and in-person opportunities going forward. But from my experience, I don't think I'll ever be a full-time um, professional in an office setting collaborating exactly the way we used to. Um, so that's, yeah. Oh, I do. <laughs> you know, I appreciate this question and it, I realize that my answer, I hesitated, I'm hesitating to say because I've never said it out loud. <laughs> but I think, um, Working in philanthropy, it's rewarding, but it also makes me realize just how much power or influence a donor has. And I do have concern that as government funding decreases and we enter into this more post-COVID era, um, that the, I remember growing up, they always said, the richer get richer, the poorer get poorer, right? And that the middle class was shrinking. And so I always think in terms of like making sure that we're sharing the power, right? Mm -hmm. So um, another reason that I'm very much for trust-based trust -based philanthropy is because that's a way that we do that. We say, hey, here's this money, you know how to best use it. You know what it is you're trying to accomplish rather than a donor, donor telling you exactly how to use it, right? And so I, my concern is, um, making sure that we push for trust-based philanthropy more so that we're in our collaboration in the future, with, especially with intergovernmental relationships, that all of that power isn't falling on donors, those with the money and the power and the influence. Um, because it can, if that's the case, I think that what they used to say could truly happen. The richer get richer, the poorer get poorer and the middle class kind of shrinks. So um, in terms of power, I shouldn't say in terms of uh, right. economics, but in terms of power. Mm -hmm. So I've actually said that out loud now. <laughs> Thanks for your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate well, if that. nothing else, we hope these are the spaces where we can start to have those conversations. Um, Absolutely. We, oh. we need to. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to, I, we noted in the chat that there was a question that came in um, uh, from Matthew uh, directed to Madeline. Um, the question is, can you talk at all about how much impact the bipartisan infrastructure law has had on the transit systems in California? Sure, I can do my best to answer. And I, um, we in, at the state level, the state's Department of Transportation, I've seen the influence of, and I believe these are the same thing, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act I, is what we will refer to as the, is that, is, is that the same thing? Um, but I can speak to the in Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act impacts. And, and what I will say is that that bill has created a massive amount of new revenue that is directly dedicated towards sort of green transportation solutions, including transit. And so we're seeing, for example, we're hiring brand new staffing positions dedicated to supporting the implementation of transit planning practices 
um, in the state of California. I don't have the the financials directly to my head, but there's a website rebuildingcalifornia.gov that that sort of dis details a little bit more of the um, the fiscal impacts of the Infra Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act over the next handful of fiscal years. But what I will say is that the, the transit agencies are adapting and growing back into their, I think LA Metro recently re-achieved re their um, pre-COVID ridership numbers. And so we're seeing that ridership will has the capacity to return um, and these new newly resourced positions and resources for transit and, and climate and energy will be um, continue to support that that return. Hopefully that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, thanks Madeline. Um, moving along just so we can get because I know we have a hand raised and we have another question in the chat so um, next we'll go to um, see Dr. Arapas who's a faculty member in our department um, please ask your question yeah hi thank you so much and thanks everyone for you know this uh, wonderful conversation um, I guess my question is from a faculty perspective I'd like to ask our panelists what do you think public administration programs should do? to equip our MPA students with uh, skills that will make them effective leaders in crises such as the one that we have you know, experienced. We know that this is not gonna be the only time that you know, governments and nonprofit organizations and so on will face right, similar sort of experiences. So what can we do to help? Thank you. That's that's a great question, Dr. Rappas. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll take a stab at this first. Um, one of the things that we've been going through recently has been comprehensive planning, and so a big portion of that is getting uh, community involvement. So we've we've held public meetings, we've been sending mailing out surveys, uh, we have an online survey available, um, and so so trying to figure out what what the community actually needs, and so. Uh, for me, you know, it, it's easy to kind of go through assuming you know what um, the people you're serving want, uh, but th then you might actually find out that's not actually the case. And so I think being willing to um, reach out and have those conversations is is an important thing to do. Um, so I, I think, you know, to your question, um, being able to teach administrators how to and, and not that I'm great at this, you know, I, I'm still feeling my way through this, um, but how to, you know, effectively reach out to the community and, and seek their feedback um, and uh, make sure that you're, you're serving them in the way that, you know, is, is uh, most, provides the most value um, for either their tax dollars or their donor dollars, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, hopefully that would be, uh, that would work. I can take Monique it. or Madeline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that was a great question. Um, it actually makes me reflect back to my time in grad school, grad school and say, what did I wish I knew as a student? Um, I studied public and international affairs. So generally, honestly, the curriculum was probably about the same. Um, and I anticipated going straight into government. <laughs> but I was in school right after the Great Recession. And so there were a lot of skills that we built, but it took time to really get a chance to get into the workforce and be able to apply those skills. And I think um, when I look back, I wish that I had a way to truly ask the community what, like how I should be applying these skills. You know, um, because there's so much coming at you when you're in school and there's so much great information, but the ability to take it and apply it in real time takes time to learn. And I think our curriculum was set up to try to support us doing that, but I think that curriculums need that even more. Like COVID has shown us like, you're gonna have to be able to really jump in and figure it out. Like, you know, um, time's not gonna wait for you. <laughs> 
and and you have to adjust quickly so it might be like hey like this is you make up a crisis for your students and you say like how would you get through this crisis for us we wrote policy memos all the time so it was always like i'm giving this whole you know summary of what's going on but like what if I'm the person receiving the policy memo should have been the question like how are you going to take this and create a program or or respond to the crisis that's happening. That's great, thank you so much um, for your responses for the questions. Um, I know that there was one more question in the chat, um, but we do we want to stick um, to the time of 415 which we're just a couple minutes over so we are going to end there with our Q and a. Um, I wanted to thank so much again, um, all three panelists for joining us today for offering um, such fantastic insight into this topic. Um, we look forward to continuing to have these discussions for anyone who had um, a question that they didn't get answered. Um, we certainly welcome the opportunity for you to reach out to our panelists. Um, a quick note um, on ICMA, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Please keep an eye out, especially if you are a current student um, who will be attending this program, at least through the fall. Um, we'll be doing a membership drive. Um, we're looking for both undergraduate and graduate students, both in membership and leadership positions. Um, if you have any questions about the chapter, um, how it functions at Villanova, um, ICMA in general, please don't hesitate um, to reach out to any of us um, who are listed here. Um, and otherwise, uh, for those who are finishing up their semester, good luck. It's about a month left um, for everyone else. Thanks again for tuning in today. Um, have a lovely rest of your Monday. Um, and uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at more ICMA events in the future. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great job.